Kaizen is a life philosophy of continual improvement, and this YouTube series is devoted to passing knowledge or ideas in the spirit of that philosophy. In this episode, I'm going to talk about building Q engines in Max. Uh, before I start, I recommend that you go back and watch my first Max episode to get an idea of what the program is all about and how it works. I'll wait right here and I'll put on this Max patch uh, while I wait. Done? Good, sweet. The term patch is used to describe the program that you build inside of a max window. Uh, within that patch window, you can create what's called sub patches that open up new windows using the patcher object. That's what I did with this Jeopardy patch I created. This is a sub patch within that patcher window. There are a few different reasons to have sub patches. One is for modularity, so that you can easily copy and paste one of these patches from one place to the other if you want to use the same functionality somewhere else. Another is for organizational purposes, because you don't want to take a single patch that has a million patch cords and then try to debug it. It's easier if you can put it into small bite-sized chunks. You may also use a subpatch to create an end user UI so that it's easier for a performer to a friend to activate patches within your project and to track what's going on without having to really understand how Max is actually programmed. So the Jeopardy patch that I created is just a subpatch, but all of the information in the patch cords is all contained within this particular example. But if you have a lot of subpatches, then you need a way to be able to take some of this information and pass it into other subpatches as necessary. And the way that you do that is to use this object that's called send and receive. Here you've got this one slider and you can see that I've got this slider is directly attached to this other slider so that if I modify this slider here then I can change the slider down below. If I want to take those values and I want to put that into another area then I used a object called send which it can be abbreviated as s and just give it a variable name. So we're gonna say slider value. So if I attach a patch cord to that slider value, then if I have another slider, another object rather, I'm sorry, another object that's for slider value, that's the receive end. Let's just take this and we're gonna duplicate that. And attach that cord there, then if I move this value, this slider, then you can see that that send slider value is being sent to this receive slider value in the same patch. But it doesn't need to be in the same patch. This send object will send to any place where there is a receive slider value in any open window whatsoever. So let's say I create another sub patch, it's called uh, sub patch one, and I create a slider and I create another receive object that has slider value. Then again, here you can see that once I move this slider around, that that slider is moving for every receive object for this send object. So it's an easy way to remotely take a value and go from one place to the other. So then one of the primary ways that I use send and receive, aside from just visual things or passing other variables, would be to take note data that I have and pass the note data from one place to the other. So here I have a note in object, and that is sending the MIDI value and the velocity to a note out object so that you can actually hear what's uh, being played. But aside from that, I'm also using a strip note to pass that information to this object that I'm calling keynote data, and then I'm also taking the note, velo note and the velocity and I'm packing that into a list and then I'm sending that out to key note plus velocity. But here I then take the key note data value and I throw that into this object here just so that I can see the value of the MIDI note number to track and make sure that I know where I am. Um, when I'm doing test driving or even in performance if the performer wants to see what MIDI note value they're, they last held down then they can see that. When I talk about Q engines, then I'm talking about ways to activate or deactivate sub patches based on what my performer is going to play. There's lots of different ways to create cues, but the way that I cue the most uses pitches as the conduit. Now there are two different ways that I do that. 
One is to use a single no trigger. So I have this object here. If I send a message of one trigger plus MIDI value, then this receive object takes it and then pipes that to a couple of different places. First, it pipes that into this number object here. So I can say, here's my default here, uh, one trigger 55. It sends that trigger 55 into a select object. And then it also uh, turns on this gate because this gate is gonna switch over to the right if the value is uh, non-zero and it switches over to the left if the value is zero. So now this keynote data, which I have over here, is looking for note 55 in order to actually cue, send a bang to this object, which will send to Q bang. Here now, if I take this and I find note, if I take that 55 and then hit that 55, that sends a bang to this object right here and that activates to the next cue. The other way that I use cues is to use this function. Say that you don't want to have it just be about one note um, because you maybe want to have the performer be able to play that note or play several notes before it actually activates something. So I have this thing that's called my fuzzy trigger. So here I have three numbers, 60, 64, 67. So now it's going to listen for those numbers in order, 60, 64, 67, with any number of notes in between, just to give it some flexibility. So if I activate this to, for my fuzzy trigger, then it's gonna be looking first for note 60. You can track the notes that I have here. It's not looking for any of these notes. And then as soon as I put my 60 in, then the 60 was down there. It says, oh, you found the 60. Now I'm gonna go and look for the next number and that's gonna be 64. So now I can hit 60, it's not gonna do anything. I can go through all of these and then eventually hit 64. And then it says, okay, you hit 64, now you're gonna go for the last number and find that. And then when I hit 64, 67 here, then that ends the whole function with this bang. It sends a cue to that cue bang and then also turns off this gate so it's not looking for any other triggers. So those are the two primary ways that I deal with cues as you go through an entire piece of music. The way that I sequence that is to use this one function that you have in Max that's called call or collective. All of these objects here are objects that I am send, uh, sending a signal to in the same way that I do send and receive. So in my patches I have, I'll just show you that right now. I've got, um, this performance pass is called Circus Echo, and it's looking for any sig anything that comes in through this receive Circus Echo object. So if I do Circus Echo 3000, it sends 3000 here, sends, opens up this gate, and if I do this, then it activates the function of Circus Echo, which takes the notes that I have, delays it by 3000 milliseconds, and um, adds 26 notes to it. And then I have another function here. If you take a look at this list again, I've got this function that's called drone. And if I open up drone, then you can see I've got lots of different things going on here. But if I set up this drone here, I say 10710, that is gonna unpack that 107 and 10 into two separate things here. Send the 107 to the select object to, to figure out if this is a zero or a non-zero. It also unpacks it over here which sends the 107 to the left-hand side and sends the 10 over to the right-hand side. And that then cues a bunch of stuff that's going on underneath. So if I do t drone 10710, then that's what activates that. And if I play a bunch of notes, then that resets the velocity until it reaches down the threshold of 10. And if I do uh, another one, drone 93, and that adds another note to that mix that fades down to a velocity of 10. And if I press notes, then that's going to reset that velocity to 127 until it goes back down to 10. The final thing that I've got here in this collective has to do with noteless player. Primarily what you do is you say that you want to turn on this noteless player. And it's gonna play a list that I have in this collection, this collection here, which is a list of MIDI notes that go um, 22 different MIDI notes. There's a counter here that iterates through these 22 notes at a tempo of 150, 150 milliseconds. And there's a few other different kind of things that happen through that. But when I have this function here, this cue that comes in from this fuzzy trigger, it will activate this noteless player 
and then look for the next cue. The thing that it activates next is it says, okay, I want you to shift the stuff that's being played from this side of the gate to this side of the gate. And that basically takes this uh, make note and turns it from this program on, on channel 8 to this program over channel 9 in the span of 15 seconds or 10 seconds or however many seconds that I want. So here if I say uh, shift to 15, then gradually, over a period of 15 seconds, it's going to shift stuff happening from channel 8 over to channel 9. And if I hit uh, no player zero, then that turns the whole function off and resets everything that's here. Clearly, I activated a lot of that stuff through this noteless player, through these individual message boxes, but you can do that also through the queue engine. So here I've got this queue list section set up. This is the queue list that I just opened up that has all those functions. So if I have here this counter that starts at zero, then any place that I have queue bang, which is at the end of one trigger, it'll send a queue bang here, or at the end of fuzzy trigger, where it sends a queue bang here, then it will iterate this counter and send in the next queue. I've got this first queue that I'm setting up to be note 60. It's waiting for note 60 in this one note trigger over here. It's going to look for note 60. So once I press note 60, then it's going to activate circus echo, and then it's going to activate the next trigger that it's looking for, which is note 72. So now when I play a bunch of notes, you can hear that Circus Echo is being activated 3,000 milliseconds after I play individual notes. And that's going to go until I hit note 72. Once I hit note 72, it activates Circus Echo 1500 and sets up the next trigger for note 66. So now, when I play these notes here, you can tell that the Circus Echo has started earlier at a span of 1500 milliseconds instead of 3000 seconds. No, uh, 3000 milliseconds, sorry. And that's going to go until I hit no trigger 66. And as soon as I hit no trigger 66, turns off the Circus Echo and looks for the next trigger. So that's the idea of taking queue engines. You use a send and received object to actually create ways to activate or deactivate things, and then you create a way to use MIDI notes as a trigger, either a single note or multiple number of notes to, to use as triggers, and then you create the performance order of what you want triggered and how through those MIDI notes and through those individual sub patches. So let me just run through all of those in a more, say, performance context. Here's an improvised thing with these nine or 10 cues.
There you go. So just a quick idea of how you can use Q engines in order to activate different things that you have going on uh, between different patches. And again, like I had in my first introductory video, uh, this I'm using this right now purely for MIDI, but you can also use it to activate samples, audio samples, or you can use it to manipulate video. You can try to create different things and different kinds of cues in order to activate the same sorts of things and it creates a great deal of flexibility and versatility to allow a performer to be more expressive because really the whole purpose of this is to create um, music that can still involve electronic sounds and electronic things but have performers react to it because back in the 60s slash 70s when electronic music started to become more explored in art music the only ways that you could get that to happen was if the electronic part was done on tape and then the tape was performed live and then the live performer would then have to follow the tape and especially if things were free tempo, then sometimes you'd have to start a stopwatch and see that stopwatch run for a while or there would have to be pulse inside of the actual electronics or, or very um, specific aural cues so that the performer could perform with the cues. But it made performances really rigid because the tape couldn't be modified unless you had an engineer that would stop the cues versus start the cues. Once this program came into existence, then it allowed composers to be able to program electronic sounds that the performer could then take control of. It's the computer that's listening to the live performer play, not the live performer that has to listen to the computer play. And that creates a sense of organicism in the music that you want to have when you're performing in live performance. Unless you're in a drum corps or in a marching band field where the speed of sound actually matters across an entire football field, nobody is, should be performing to a click track um, in order to truly make music into music and not just notes on a page or even just dynamics on a page. And this program, uh, allows you to be able to do that. So I hope that was helpful to you. If you have any questions about this program or about um, anything else related to electronic music and interactive music, then feel free to leave me a comment. If you like what I'm doing, then please leave me a like and comment or subscribe and let me know what you think about it. Um, if you have any suggestions for future topics for my Kaizen video series about continual improvement. I've now done something on Max. I've done something on video games. I've done something on expected value in poker. And I have other ideas, but I'm definitely open to hearing what other people have for input. I definitely take any user comments or feedback uh, very seriously. Thanks very much, and I'll see you guys in the next video.